Hello, welcome and namaste. Today, my guest is Eugene. I met her at Dallas Software Development Group. She was one of my team members in last cohort. And not just that, she was an amazing team member and she, she plays a very crucial role in completing that project in, for that team. And uh, with that, I want to hand over my mic to Fuchin. And she actually led a team this time, and her team did amazingly well. So with that, Eugene, please share about yourself, your job, anything that you want to include. So oh, hello. My name is Eugene. And sometimes I go by my nickname, which is Yoon. And yeah, I met Manad during the DSD cohort it was like last year. And he was my team lead. and. We definitely went through some struggles during that cohort, but I feel like we pulled it very well and then made sure we had a working MVP. So that was a pretty good success. And through that experience, it did help me fill in a lot of gaps that I felt like I was missing because I did not come from a traditional background. I don't have the computer science degree. I was actually career changing from a project manager into software engineer. And that cohort that you led and I was a member of, I learned a lot of uh, collaboration skills that I feel like I was missing because that's usually not very well taught either in like a boot camp or when you're self-taught, like that skill is very hard to find and to actually like acquire. So that was a good experience for me. And it was definitely a big reason of why I got hired too, because they were very excited that I went out of my way to find this missing experience and to just fill it on my own rather than having someone tell me like I need this. So I feel like that was a good part of why I got my job and it definitely did teach me a lot of skills I was missing. And now I work at NBC Universal as a software engineer. And if you want to follow me on my LinkedIn, I have LinkedIn, I believe is Bay Dash Eugen is like my URL. And then I have my own personal website, which I believe is cloudybay.com. I will add both the link to hyperlink to LinkedIn as well as your portfolio site. And talking about portfolio site, when you launched that last year, it was an amazing hit. I think it got a lot of responses and, and I loved it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it definitely was one of my posts that went, I don't know, it was like, definitely, I've never hit like that type of reach before, but for some reason that post just hit so many like views and I had so many comments and people liked it a lot and I got some really good feedback and I'm not a front end person, so mm -hmm. to make like a design and UI and making it look pretty was definitely out of my own comfort zone, but I also wanted to be me like I wanted to represent me and so that's why I picked like a very pink curly uh kind I was of was about so to say that see. I was about to say that that actually reflect your personality and knowing you in that software group and after I knew just by looking at that it, it looked like you are speaking to us yeah that's what I was trying to go for because I've seen a lot of like portfolio sites they're very pretty they're very like UI aesthetic but I feel like they lack personality in a way because they all kind of look the same in a way so I wanted mine to just be me and I didn't want to like regret or like that I didn't put my personality mm -hmm. into it because mm -hmm. if you don't like me for who I am I probably don't want to work with you in the first place so if you're going to judge me that my website is pink then I, I probably don't want to work with you that's super powerful that reflect two things that reflect two things number one that you know who you are and most people don't like it takes time to understand who they are and to the label when they you, you actually understand like the personality points and behaviors and some patterns and then second you are at a point have courage to decide which company you want to work at versus there are programmers in the early stage or just want to get any job, right? They, they are not at the luxury of selecting. So 
I want to ask a follow-up question. How did that happen? First, how did you find yourself? And then second, how did you come to the point where you actually feel so confident about choosing? So I'm not new to the workforce. I've been a project manager and I've been working for a decade now. So I knew, I've had experiences where I've had not the greatest companies I've worked for and I know I didn't enjoy it. And I was lucky enough where my partner was willing to pay for all my financial. Mm-hmm. And he told me specifically to join a company that I actually want to join. Because if I'm going to go through this career transition and go back to a company that I don't like, it's going to burn me out again. And he doesn't want that to happen. So I was very fortunate where I could be a little more picky with who I wanted to work for. And I had a list, I think I had five non-negotiable traits that I needed to see from the company. Like one of them was, I wanted the work schedule to be flexible. It didn't have to be fully remote, but remote was a nice plus. Just because Mm -hmm. I know personally, I work better in that type of environment. And I, I don't typically do very well when it's a very rigid, like nine to five and typical work schedule. So I knew what I wanted was that is to be more flexible work schedule, whether it be hybrid or remote. And then I also wanted a really good manager. So I didn't want anyone who was like very big on micromanaging or always telling me like, you do this and this. I wanted someone who was more of a leader, who is my manager rather than a manager who's just a manager. So I think out of all of my lists, like those two were the biggest, most important things to me. And every time I interviewed a company, I always made sure to ask questions relating to like their culture, how they micromanage or like how they manage anything and how Mm -hmm. They basically just treat their employees on a day-to-day basis. And there definitely were some companies where I got offers. I actually got an offer one month of the job searching because my job search was six months long. First month in, I got an offer. I could have taken it, but it was definitely a company that didn't fully align with what I wanted. So I ended up actually rejecting the offer. But I'm very happy with my decision because where I landed now, I feel like it's everything that I've wanted. Awesome. And I think the, some credit goes to your partner. So kudos to him or her. Yeah, he definitely was a big supporter in my whole journey because he always kept reminding me because I had like times where I was like rejecting jobs, but then I also got rejected a lot too. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> sometimes I felt like regret, like I should have, maybe I should have just taken that job because then I wouldn't have to go through this like rejection or constant knows or getting mm-hmm. ghosted and whatnot and then he was just like you wouldn't have liked it though so oh. just keep applying keep studying whatever and then he was right yeah yeah it, it's great to have someone like them so kudos to them and then congratulations that you have somebody like that so let's go back to For this job, I want to ask you, what's your typical day look like? Typical day or a typical week look like at this job? So at work, my team is fully remote. We're also not very big on using our webcams too, which is funny. We start off our day with stand-up. I feel like it's a very typical (laughs) way to start your day. And my team is actually, the majority is in California. We're a Pacific time zone team, but I'm in the central. There are two hours behind me. So we have stand up at 12 p.m. my time. And I'll get on a little earlier, whether it be like 9 or 10 a.m. Because that time zone between 9 and 10 a.m. to stand up is like when I could really focus without any interruptions from anyone because everyone is still asleep. And that's how I usually start my day. And it will do stand up. Our stand up is pretty quick. I think it's only five to 10 minutes long. And after that, if we have meetings, we'll go to the meetings. But lately I haven't had too many meetings. It's usually just been like stand up. And then at the start of the sprint, we'll have like our sprint planning like the day before. So we know what tasks we need to do. And our sprints are every two weeks. And regarding the sprint, we only have one task assigned to us at the start. 
And we get to choose what that task is, as long as there's no like weird dependencies that are blocking it in the first place. And from there, my manager has a lot of trust in us. So we have all the tickets that we want completed and like what our velocity sprint points we're aiming for. And we'll have all of these tickets laid out, but they're just not assigned to anyone. And as we finish our ticket, we just pick a new one and assign it to ourselves and just continue completing them. And he has a lot of trust that we will complete everything that is supposed to be completed for a sprint. And we've never had any issues not completing them. We're actually having the opposite problem where we're completing too much and mm -hmm. we're going over like this 100% rate. So we end up doing 110 to 120%, which doesn't look too great. It's like having a good problem, but like leadership wants us to bring it down to 100% or 99, you know, just to make it more, make more sense. But he said it's a good problem. So this is interesting. We also do a scrum and two week scrum, but, and I have spoken to many other people in other companies who are doing scrum, but I have not heard about this one. So tell me more about it. So you pick one and then as soon as you finish something and enough time is available, you would pick another one. So ahead of time, before the sprint starts, we have to make sure that our sprint has all the tickets. Say we're doing like 30 points or something like that for that sprint. All the tickets that we need to get completed to get 30 points is already assigned we have them available and ready and they just sit in the sprint board just like on a oh okay okay okay, okay, okay. not in the backlog but the sprint board good that i clarified it. Yeah. i thought you guys only pick one item in the sprint board and then you pick from the backlog oh um, no so it's already on the sprint board it's just completely unassigned and product already went through it figure out what is like the highest priority what needs to get completed because we've had this tendency of over achieving our goal what my product person does is for the next sprint he puts all of the tasks mm. that are the highest priority at the top so we know exactly what to drag in if we have that he do awesome and then do you have a formal Scrum Master or not? I don't, we do have a Scrum Master, but I feel like she's more like, she's just like the team mom to say. So oh. we're very good at making sure there is a good separation. Like we collaborate and we have good separation at the same time with mm -hmm. product. And she's very good at separating at what meetings we actually have to be involved in. Because sometimes they're like, oh, you need the entire team. And she'll be like, no, we only need like, the manager, you don't have to involve every developer in this meeting. Mm -hmm. So she mm -hmm. makes sure that we don't have like excess meetings when we really don't need it, which is very nice. Yeah. Give you focus. Like you, she's the protector of the team so that developer can focus. And is she has one team or many team as a scrum master? I believe she has two teams. So we're one of the teams and then. He's also the scrum master for one of our sister teams. Okay. Thank you for sharing all this. In this one year, what has worked for you? And like, start with when you joined this company and where you are today, how big is that difference? And what has worked to help you get there? So I would say I've always been very curious as a person, but even when I was job searching, I made a lot of projects just because I was curious about a certain technology tool, et cetera, and I just wanted to use it. And that curiosity has helped me a lot with work too, because two months into my job, I was going into our database. My senior found like the start of an issue and she brought it up to our manager and our manager was like, oh, that's definitely not right. Because we had a duplicated records in our database and our production database. And our manager was like, there's going to be the manual process to this. But it was such an ambiguous like bug we un uncovered that we didn't really know how much work was going to be put into this. Mm. And no one wants to do like manual work. And it's very tedious. But being me, like, 
my team uses a NoSQL database. I wasn't too familiar with a NoSQL database structure. Yeah. I was very familiar with SQL, which I feel like most people, SQL is what yeah. you learn first. So I was like, okay, I, I will take on this task because I feel like it's a good way for me to understand this NoSQL database at a faster level because I learn by doing. And if I could learn by doing the database and fixing this issue, it would probably help me pick up what our database actually does and how it's structured and how the queries work and everything, because I was still so used to the SQL like knowledge in my head that it was conflicting with how it actually works for our team's product. So I took on the task, even though I didn't really know how to go about it very much, but my team actually trusted me enough to actually give it to me. There is like a really? junior coming in. She's only been here for a month and a half, two months. And we're going to let her like touch our production database. That's not very common. My team was actually very supportive of that. And they're just like, if you break it, just rewind it. It's fine. Just make a copy <laughs> before you take it. <laughs> they're very supportive of that. And I appreciate that because of that support. I was able to basically complete the task of fixing this issue, it turned out to be a lot bigger than what it actually was. Cause as I dug into it, it kept getting bigger and bigger of what the issue was. And it ended up affecting, why did the math? It ended up 22% of our database was compromised. So wow. that's a very large chunk when we're dealing with how many records we had at that time. And it took me about two months to fix it. And Benny. my team actually let me fix it by myself too. Cause they saw me like progressing with every step that I had to do. And I was very over communicative of what I was doing. And my team was like, okay, she's like on track. She's doing it right. She's not breaking anything. Nothing has crashed yet. So let's keep trusting what she's doing. And my curiosity just led me down this rabbit hole on their database and I fixed it two months and then I actually got awarded like a gift for fixing our database because I fixed it without it ever crashing or like we never had to do any downtime. So it was like what you said, like I remember you told me during our cohort, it was 60% planning and like 40% like actually completing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I did. I had this obsidian notebook which is the plans for every single step I had to do to make sure. I removed everything as smoothly as possible without any downtime because I was trying my best to avoid downtime. And we don't like to do any releases on non-business hours. So I was trying to figure out how do I fix this during business hours where I have the support of like my teammates and we don't have to do anything off hours. And a lot of planning, a lot of like reviews, like with my seniors and actually my senior principal engineer, he actually helped me like with re reviews and stuff like that. And then he ended up becoming my mentor because of this too, which is mm -hmm. a nice plus. And now my team, they call me an SME, which is the subject matter as for, for our database now, because I've gotten mm -hmm. so good at our database just because of this one task or one long task that I had to do for this bug. And I got to do it because I was curious. And I was also volunteering myself to do it because no one wanted to do it. And it was painful at first and it kept unraveling more bugs. But then because of that, I learned so much in such a short time frame. I think I went from being so confused about our database. And then in about a month, I was like, I completely understood everything about it. And it got them to the point where I was collaborating with like our client teams that were using our API. And they just went straight to me instead of talk to anyone else. Cause they're like, oh, this girl knows what she's talking about with the database. So anytime they ever had any issues or like questions, they would just message me instead of anyone mm -hmm. else on my team. And I've gotten like that reputation now where if we need help, we just message her. Wow. This is a very powerful story and something that people can follow. It's always happened that there is a situation and there will be some natural leaders who will step up and there will be people who will be more cautious, right? And then there will be people who will wait for other person to assign it to them. And the people who take the initiative, they 
gets the opportunity. Originally, nobody will tell you that because you will do this, you will get an award, you will get uh, trust, you will get a ownership of an area, and then you will become a dependent that nobody wants. You are an integral part of the team, right? Nobody have told you all that. And if somebody have said all these things, there may be two other people who would be uh, willing to step up. But the thing is, when you don't see any of those things and you step up naturally, that's when things happen. Yeah, definitely. That was a big factor of how my team began to trust me very quickly. And now they've always treated me like as an equal on the team, no matter what my title was, but it's definitely more, yeah, she could do it. I have no questions about that. And it's like any task, they'll be like, yeah, she'll figure it out. That's fine. If she has questions, she'll ask us. Or it's like anything. I feel like a lot of juniors are usually stuck with, I need to do this training beforehand, mm -hmm. or they're stuck in this tutorial hell or whatever that they call it, where they're just stuck on, you need to just do all this unit tests, or you need to watch this tutorial and you're just stuck doing that for a year. Luckily, because I volunteer myself, I feel like all the tasks I get, they're like very senior tasks and they'll give me like the highest point ticket. And then they'll be like, yeah, she'll be fine. She'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. So because I have that trust now and like my manager trusts me too. All of my senior engineers trust me. And now I have like my senior principal engineer who comes and just, I like your curiosity. And then we'll just have like coffee chats all the time. And he'll just help me with like random mentorship stuff. And it's very nice. I will tell you that the same thing that you can apply later on, this was for doing a project or task, right? You can apply the same thing to fill a role. And the way it worked for me is there was a time when our manager left to another company, something else, and we had a gap there between the time that uh, he left and then the time that the directors and VP would hire someone else. So that gap of three to four months, sorry, four to six month gap, I naturally step up, fill the gap and the team accepted it, but I was genuinely helping to fill the gap. And then what happened, they made me team leader then after the situation was resolved, they brought someone else, but uh, they noticed what I have contributed to and I became team leader. Similarly, in my previous company, I became a project ma uh, leader. Just because of those situations that I was filling the gap, whether it is technical or non-technical, right? Role or a task. So that will help you. That attitude will always help you. I feel like definitely my skills that I've had as a project manager has helped a lot. Engineering right. position. Because my manager calls me an edge case out of like, just as like a nickname. Because you know how to talk to people. You could communicate business like ways and you know how to break down technical terms where non-technical people can understand it you mm -hmm. like that's a very great skill to have and he's very happy that I have that skill and it's because of like my old career I was I had to talk to people all the time I had to break things down where it was easy to digest and that skill has become insanely useful for this job so that that brought this point right you probably have already thought about this. So there is a vertical growth and then there is horizontal growth. And for a engineer, typically that horizontal growth come from becoming a product owner, product managers, or engineering managers, right? Vertically, you will go to either a architect or a engineering manager, but on the horizontal side, you can slip into product manager role, uh, especially technical product manager who typically is higher paying job because they know technology and they know customer. So just keep that in mind. I don't know if you have already thought about that kind of segregation, but in your case, because of all that, one thing that you could do is when you're setting your three years, how that next three year look like, you could pick all these possible positions and how much scope is there and which one you like, you may be a very good uh, technical product manager. Yeah, luckily enough, my manager actually talked about that with me because I have bi-weekly like one-on-ones with him. Mm -hmm. And he was like, 
I don't want to plan for like how you are next year. I want to plan like your five years, like what your goals are. And mm -hmm. he's very big on like, even if you're not here, like in five years, I want to still help get you to your five-year goal. And he has me, what if I have a, I want to be an engineering manager or I want to be an architect. He'll get someone who is in that position where I can shadow them in a way. So I can just learn like how they are like on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm very big on this. So I'm going to deep down onto this. Um, I'm very big on this topic that when initially all you can think about is to get a job, but once you get a job, the next big thing is how your three to five year look like, right? And most people, unfortunately, or many people, unfortunately, go in autopilot mode in which they are very much day-to-day -day things that are happening. They're getting praises or they're sometimes sad because they did not get the praise or somebody else took the credit, but we have to think beyond one year or two year annual appraisal and things like that. Right? So in your case, how does that work or what are the specific activities that you have done or your managers have done? So I'm more leaning on being like an architect position because I know I can go, our company, we have both for an individual contributor. So if you want to be an individual contributor in my company, we, you can be, it goes from the regular engineering and then senior staff, principal, et cetera, engineer, but you can also go off and be an architect too. And that would still fall under the individual contributor. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite is the manager side. And I was more interested in going to be the individual, but then like branch off into being an architect rather than a senior or soft senior principal, et cetera, engineer. And I want to be an architect because I feel like I do a bit of everything. You help multiple teams with a very overall goal, but you still need to have a very strong technology like background to understand like what engineers will be doing. So that path very much interests me because I feel like it's a very good career to combine all the skills that I have and be useful all at once. So to get to that is my manager has been just helping me get all these skills first that I need to get to this mm -hmm. position. And I've been telling him like, oh, I did this whole DSD thing. I actually ended up being like a team lead for this. And he was like, okay, that's a great thing to have because he's okay, you're learning how to like lead a team because these are not skills that you can get right away. So being exposed to that is like a great start. And he actually writes it down as like, skills that I'm gaining just so he could say it to HR. He's like, it may not be at work, but she is still getting these skills like yeah. outside of work, yeah. which should still count. And he's very happy. Like I'm, I did that and I told him, so he's been writing down that he wrote down. I did like a talk for a conference. He wrote that down as like a skill that I also gained too. He was like, you did public speaking. Great. And. So he's writing everything I've done externally down as skills that I can contribute to work to help me speed up any type of like promotions or anything or be like, this is proof to HR that she deserves this title or that she should go this path, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And my manager is very supportive of that. And I feel anytime I've had any questions, he'll link me to the person who will have those answers too. And you have a kind of return type of roadmap or something? So we have, we, it's actually brand new. They just made this week. Okay. But they were making like this software engineer framework for a while now that just got finished. And it uh -huh. has like a direct roadmap of how to get to each level, what the skills they're expecting from each level okay. too. Okay. Okay. And I will end this particular session by saying this. I... I think I wasted probably three, four years deciding to go between architect role and manager role. Initially, I did not want to be a manager. I wanted to stay in technology. And it just happened that I went into this direction. And I'm so glad because I did not miss any of the technology thing that, that I originally thought I would miss. In fact, it, it exponentially increased because now 
at that time, I started looking at five application, five different themes, and each theme, wherever the, the fun was happening, fun as in crucial things are happening, production release are happening, or production down type thing is happening, you were there. So you were having all those fun anyway, but it just removed the repeat work that you would do in coding. So all I'm saying, I'm not pushing anything to you, but I'm saying just be open-minded. Whichever position comes first, take that. If this is a team leader position or a manager position, just take it. I think you will be excellent there. I've seen you. Oh, thank you. So yeah, just take it. I, I think you will do great. And whenever that happened, have a complete reset. Mm -hmm. There is a very famous book, What Got You Here Will Not Get You There. It's a very famous book. The concept is, as a developer, individual contributor that you said, you are praised and uh, uh, rewarded for the skill that won't work when you are changing the role. It, most of the time, it has to start from scratch. The most important thing that I felt like I missed anytime I change my role is the gut feeling. Mm -hmm. And I'm somebody who go by gut feeling more than the fact I just go by my, what I feel. And with new role, you miss that. Like it, it build up with time. And as you said, you're somebody who learn by doing things. So for people like us, it takes time to build up that gut feeling. And once you have that gut feeling, you're awesome. Yeah. That's a good point because I know from my company, I know there's like some companies that like the managers don't know how to do any coding or they're not very technical at all. For my company, we actually require all of our engineering managers to know how to code and they still should be able to contribute to our code base if needed. That would be very rare, but if they had to for an emergency, they can. And I feel like my manager, he definitely still knows how to code. He's very, although he doesn't code with the language we use, he codes in Go. So he knows how to translate it very well to Python because Python is not very hard to translate syntax wise. And I feel like that's a very valuable skill, at least for my company that I've seen. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be against doing engineering manager if it did require you to still have like technical knowledge and being still technically available to help out. But it just depends on the company because I know not all companies are like that. Yeah, m many companies, especially in US, most of the company, I would say most, but many companies, like I have friends in many different companies and they are all uh, very technically heavy. But it changes, like your perspective changes from a class, a function to a class, to a library, to a microservice to a project, to an impact that you're making, an influence that you're making to whatever problem that you're solving. So just you get a layer up to a bigger perspective. And it's almost like if you are near a mountain, you get amazing view at the top and amazing view at the bottom. And different layer, right? At the bottom, you will be able to see the lake a beautiful lake and then trees. And then if you go at the top, you will be able to see so many other mountain peaks and valley. So it's not that which view is good or bad. It just same kind of excitement at each level. I like that yeah. analogy. I never thought of it like that. So that's a pretty good one. I like that. Yeah. So you will be able to see at the manager level, you will be probably able to see five different projects, five different peaks. And at any point, you will have an option to go deeper into any of those peak, those mountains and have a conversation with whoever is working there. You even able to get the entire picture, work on that project, work on the problem, and then come back, go to another one. I like that. That, that makes me more curious about the engineering, like management, because I never, I just never thought of them. Maybe I'm a bad influencer today. Uh, no, because I'm, I'm dumb. still like, I'm still picking what I want to do. I like, I haven't, I'm not concrete on anything. Yeah, bad influencer in a way, your company might have just lost one architect. 
why not have like experience of just a little bit of both before it yeah. once? Hey, yeah, spend time, enjoy what you have, and then keep going. Wow, we spend a lot of time in this one. It's okay. I don't have the crew queue. Okay, so I will pick uh, one more topic. You said when you was preparing for the your first job or the change in your career, you did a lot of projects. So tell about that. I have heard many developers who are trying to find job, like they are not able to decide which project to do or the project idea or finding the team members or right. They go too much into the tactical mode versus just doing the project. So tell, what was your thought process? How did you pick ideas and how did you execute them? So I knew how bad the market was when I was just searching for a job. So I made sure the projects I made were valuable, at least to the point where I will actually learn something from it. Because I didn't want to fall into that trap of just doing one tutorial, next tutorial, etc. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm just following code, I don't really understand what I just did exactly. Because my brain just doesn't work like that. Like I need to like make it myself. So I tried to avoid tutorials if I could. And I basically just made little things that I thought was fun for me. Because if it was fun for me, I actually did them. And I tried to solve them a little further and further every time. And I think I started off with two different projects. They were very mm -hmm. basic. There was nothing special about them. But then as I learned more tools, like say, like I learned like Docker, or like I learned Terraform, et cetera, I would mm -hmm. go back to those projects and implement those tools I just learned into them. And I would just make a new version of my project. And it went from like version one. And then I went to like version 20, <laughs> like what like, I did, like, like going, constantly going back. Can you give me an example of those two projects? Because I want to give really uh, a concrete tactical thing that they don't have to overthink. So I started off with Python because that's just what I learned mm -hmm. language wise. And I was like, okay, okay, what can I do with Python? And I actually came from a boot camp. My boot camp was not full stack. It was actually a DevOps boot camp. So I went and learned a lot of DevOps stuff and like scripting, not really necessarily like development. Mm -hmm. So I was curious on the development side of coding. And I was like, okay, what can I do with Python? And I was like, okay, what is this thing called Flask? And I learned what Flask was. And Flask was, it's just a Python framework. So that was like my first step into software development. So I started with a very basic like Flask application just to make it work. It was very ugly. Mm -hmm. And all it did was like, you can click the button to like input like a word and like your name and it just stored it. <laughs> the other thing that. That's what I'm talking about. This is exactly why I was asking. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be super fancy. It doesn't have to be... Uh, a, a groundbreaking idea. Mm -hmm. It was super basic. And then I just took that idea and I evolved it. So it went from just like a simple input to where I could upload an image to it. So I was like, okay, we're going to make it input like an image instead of just like a regular string like text. So eventually I made it where I could upload an image and it would store that image. And then evolved from that to where I started learning about Docker and I was like, oh, what is this tool? So I learned Docker and then I ended up learning how to make my Flask application into an image so I could use that image and then deploy it with Docker. Oh, there's my cat. And actually she was my inspiration for my project. And it evolved where I was like, I'm opening a cat. Can I do anything with that? So I actually started involving AI into my application where if I uploaded a picture, it could detect what was the picture just like a basic mm. object detection and i started like just messing around a little bit with ai so i did something with amazon's recognition which is one of their resources that has ai and i basically just fed their model hundreds of pictures of cats and hundreds of pictures of dogs and every time you would upload a picture it would tell you if it was a cat or a dog and that's I slowly evolved from that. And then I evolved it again, where I was using 
Terraform to actually create all of my AWS infrastructure that I needed. And then I created a whole like CI CD pipeline where it like automatically would update my image and use that to deploy my updated flat application. And then it evolved to where instead of just detecting if it's a cat or a dog, it can detect anything that was on the photo, like up to five objects on the photo. And it will tell you this is this, or it'll be like a cat. If it was only a cat, it will tell you different breeds of cat, like mm -hmm. a white cat. It's a whatever breed that it thinks it is. And, or if it was just like a picture with multiple things in it, it'd be like, this is a boy, this is a girl, this cow, but like whatever was in the picture. And it will do five of them. And then I advanced it again, where it would detect everything that was in the object. And it would also do a percentage of how sure it was that item. So with say, if it's like a flower, it'll tell you flower and it'll give you like a specific flower. And with an accuracy of like, I like 99% sure it is this flower. So. It just evolved into this kind of like object detection program. <laughs> and it just started with a most basic Flask application. Yeah, that's, I think this is one of, we have, you have shared a lot of impactful thing, and this is, I think one of the most impactful thing and people have to listen to this. I think just to start with a login page and then keep evolving it based on whatever idea comes at that day or whatever is the next logical thing. You reminded me of an application that I did many years ago. I, it was a web page that I built for myself. I had, I was, I really liked listening to song and I'm talking 2001 where all these iPhones, nothing exists and streaming, uh, or uh, I think streaming was new maybe, but anyway, I had CDs and cassettes, so I converted them into an MP3 and then I stored that on my office laptop and then I created a web page where I can just play them, a simple code. And, uh, and then every time I would get more files, more new album, movie album, I would just drop it in this folder. And my program will just capture that. My version world was making all this hyperlink myself. Version two was reading this file and uh, creating the link. Now understand that browser does not catch. There is a limitation. So I, I had to make a program on the server side and the client side and all make it work. And then I started sharing with my friends, like my colleague, my team members. And what happened six months later, there was people from other department and who I never met and they're complimenting me. We listen to your song. It's great. It's pretty great. Because to my friend, I gave that host file mm -hmm. so that they can put the IP and everything to access my machine in the network. And that host file or host entry went to many people in this call and then I was like that but I just learned a lot from that project because every time either I would add something or the people who was listening to it would ask something and I would keep adding that that's Sorry. a great way to go about it I built the network because of that like if people know me because of <laughs> that's really great yeah I feel like a lot of people overcomplicate it in the beginning they're just like I need this amazing project that has to fix the world or something like that. And I'm like, it doesn't have to. Like, you just start with something basic and then evolve it. Because that's, I feel like that way is really useful because you have this like track record in a way that employers can see that they're learning and they're growing and they're taking these skills they learn and mm -hmm. applying it, which is a lot harder to do than to say. Because anyone can say, I know X, Y, and Z. Do you have proof that you actually know it? And when you have this track record, they yeah. can see like proof. Wow. I had many questions more, but I think we have added too much value already. And I 
one question that I will ask is what's your goal setting method? So my goal setting method is I know what I want as like way down the line. So 10 years from now, like I want to do X, Y, and Z. So I already know that. And it's a very like large goal, very high level. There is no details about it. I just know I want to get to this point at one point in my life. And I don't have any like steps to it. I just know this is my large goal. And then from there, I'll break it down. What can I do to make this more achievable? Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure this is just because I was a project manager. This is how I used to work. I'll figure in the steps to me that I need to get there. And then with those steps, I will just break it down even further. And then each step will break down into more steps underneath. And then if that was still too complex, I would break it down even further. I would make sure everything I break down is easy enough for me to grasp and it's achievable. And if I wasn't, I would just break it down more. <laughs> Wow. You just explained work breakdown structure. So whoever is listening, please search for that. That will change your life. It changed my life when I understood what work breakdown structure mean. There's a book, GTD, Getting Things Done. And in that book, you always talk about make the plan, but then focus on what's the next thing. What is the next action? Clarify that next action. If the next action is getting the oil change in your car, then clarify that next action to the real next action. And real next action is to call the garage to take an appointment, which means the next action is to find the number to call, right? So he he explained that in the very nice terms. So between work breakdown structure and then getting things done, it has helped me completely change how it will make you very proactive. So, I don't know I, where I learned that from. But I feel like it's just like a habit. I don't. It's a I it's in the project management. Better. In the project management waterfall, the work breakdown structure is when you give a project, we just do a work breakdown structure for different like level one, level two, level three, level level four is very granular task. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely really helpful when it comes to engineering too, which I feel like a lot of people don't think about because they're like, you have to always, to get to the senior level, you have to be able to take that ambiguous thought and make it into steps that are like feasible to do. And that's a skill that you definitely have to learn to get to that senior level. So how did you find that 10 years? Goal. I, I I have faced uh, that problem that most people don't know what their 10 year look like. They know what their three month look like. See, some people know what their one year look like. So how did you get that 10 year visibility? So my 10 year visibility isn't actually like a job title. It's actually me just, I want to be comfortable and be able to afford a good life for my family. So that's actually my 10 year goal is to like, I want to own the this house and I want to be able to have my kids go to and get what they want and go to a good school in a nice neighborhood. So that's like my overall goal that I want to do and which is probably what not a lot of people would think of like when it comes to like your 10 year goal, like you're probably expecting like a job title or something like that. But no, I was, to that I was, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was even, I was in thinking you're in this term as well. That you have five, seven, eight years of your life, health, finance, family, relationship, and all. So uh, that's what I thought that you're talking about that and very specific goals around each of those areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically, like I want, that's my large goal is just to have a good life for my family, right? Mm-hmm. And I want to live pretty comfortably and not have to worry about anything financial. So that's what I want. To, and then to get to that point, I need to like get to this title to make this much money or I need to have this work-life balance and I want to like target these companies because they're known for work-life balance and et cetera. And whatever companies are very like flexible because you have family and like those are the companies I'd rather work for rather than the startup. Like I did start up life and I know that's not for me anymore because I don't want to work that many hours again. I think what I felt like 
for me at least, for me and my wife, that means that we had to build wealth, which mean the retirement fund, which mean real estate uh, portfolio, which mean uh, a side hustle, right? Obviously, other than family relationship and, and health, I'm talking about what will make you feel comfortable is when you have some assets. Real like, estate is definitely a part of my plan too. Yeah. I want to do, want to make enough money for my day job where I can invest into real estate and into stocks to oh. diversify my portfolio. Yeah. 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 And I hope uh, more and more developers, technical folks are doing something like that, right? Because learning for new pr framework is good, but ultimately when you understand that what you're earning and what you're spending is like day-to-day -day work. What you're saving and how you're investing that saving, that's where magic happens. And yeah, basic yeah, thing think... again, right? Basic thing like budget, mm -hmm. say, long-term saving, short-term saving and all that. Sorry, you yeah, said I... Oh, I was going to say, my parents actually taught me that very young because my parents are in real estate. So they told me like, don't put all of your eggs on in one basket, right? That's mm -hmm. a very common thing. Because yeah, you could have a job. The job can pay you very well, but one day you could just not have it anymore. And what are you going to do? Especially with all the layoffs coming now, I don't want to have yeah, I guess the mercy of just my job. And that's the only thing that's ever providing for me. And I don't want to have that as a reliability in a way. A lot of conversation. I think we can just do this. Like the topic that we was covering and the natural discussion that we were having, maybe we can do something like that. Monthly talk, Eugene and Vinod. <laughs> It'd be wild, like it. I, it was a nice conversation. It didn't feel like anything fancy. It was just like a conversation. I will go to my last question. Is there any question that I did not ask, but you want to answer? I don't know. I can't really think of anything super specific. I feel like we kind of brought, like, we covered a lot of different questions. It was, it became like more casual conversation where we touched a real thing, like real thing that can help people, developers. So do you have any question for me? What is the biggest thing that you see as always like the most common problem a lot of like people who are trying to transition and like what they always face that you feel like is very common between a lot of people who are trying to get their first job? For their first job, I think there are people who are not putting effort and they're trying to get to the solution quickly, which means if they know the DSA is needed and they're trying to avoid it all their life or not doing enough project. So I've seen many of those people like that and not being very strategic about their job hunt. And I will tell you just three things to give you illustration that what I'm talking about. Everybody is talking about making engagement, network, referral and all that, but they won't do the basic stuff. And that apply to somebody without experience and that apply to somebody with three years of experience. Very basic thing. If you want to build your network, instead of going and finding all the new people, hunting new people in the spaces and whatnot, just go to the people who you work with, work with, sorry, you studied with. So if you go to the college and you find all the people who was there, plus your junior, plus your senior, up to three to five years, and because you studied in that college, you will get a list, uh, alumni list. And when you send a message, they will respond back to you because you're from the same college. Right? Very high possibility. And then those many of those are in software and they will vouch for you. They will help you. So just like basic thing, people are not doing that. So to answer your question, that's the pattern that I've seen. Okay. Yeah, I think I feel like I've seen a very similar pattern too because I always get asked, 
how did I do it? Like, I get a lot of connections asking me, like, what did you do to break into tech? And there's like hard market. You don't have a degree in computer science or anything. So yeah. what did you do to stand out in that? I feel like there's times where if I say what I did, they're just like, that's too hard. Can you make it easier? Like, no, it's hard. I don't know why you think it's easy to begin with. And I feel like there's a lot of misconception about it. Where if I just do this, I'll make six figures or something like that. Yeah. I always say that first three to four years are the hardest in software. Once you have that foundation, it becomes easier and enjoyable. But the first one is really hard. Yeah, that's great. A good information. Thank you for answering that. All right. So last question. What is your message to anybody who is watching this episode? My message, I would say not to give up because I know there are times where you just have a mental breakdown because I know I did. I went through quite a few of them myself, so I understand the struggle. But if you let that win, I feel like you're just going to live with regret in a way. So just keep pushing. Obviously, if you have to do a side job or something while you're still continuing, that's fine. That's completely normal. And I feel like there's a bad stigma against that to a lot of people where they're just like, I'm, I have to make money. Do I need a dev job now? I was like, do you need a dev job now? Like, why can't you work? somewhere else in the meantime while you still study because if you only focus on getting that dev job and you're not there yet to that gap that you need to hit then it's going to take you forever to get that first dev job and you're going to be financially stressed so to relieve that stress i think they should take on you could take on a job that's not tech while have that flexibility or finance work while being able to study and you don't have to worry about can I pay my pills on time mm -hmm. so, do that. Mm -hmm. I would say don't be afraid of that and then also to just keep learning because I feel like a lot of people just stop they'll finish their boot camp and then they'll just stop they just this is what I did my capstone I was like your capstone was two years ago what did you do since and there's some people I've talked to, they're like, that, that's it. I've only done my caps. And I was like, but why? I keep learning. You shouldn't just stop because you finished your boot camp or school or your course or whatever. Just keep doing something afterwards. And just follow the advice that you had or what you did. You start with a very basic project and keep evolving it with all mm -hmm. each new technology. Just keep doing it. And it doesn't have to be anything like super fancy. Yeah, like, yeah. It doesn't have to solve world hunger or anything like that. Like I, my cat with my photo and my news and it was a silly application, but I learned a lot from it. Well, Eugene, thank you so much. This was a very fun episode and I really enjoyed like this conversation. I, I really enjoyed and I always like your company when DS, DSD and you joined some of our meetings, it was amazing. So. Thank you. And I'm I always enjoy all of my conversation with you. Yeah, I'm blessed to have a friend like you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And then you were definitely a, a big factor to getting my first job too, because I learned so much from you when you were leading DSD too. Oh, so I appreciate that. <laughs> all right.